Okay, our first speaker is Sue Carnahan, and her topic is Seize the Season, Spotlight on Annual Plants. So annual plants are really good at dealing with extreme habitat and climatic um, conditions because they basically go into a seed and sit around and wait for better conditions. So Sue is going to introduce us to annual plants that she finds attractive and appealing and make the case that they are great extremo not extremophiles because they don't love extremes, but they are great in dealing with extreme environments. So let me tell you a little bit about Sue. Sue has lived in Santa Cruz County in the rocky grasslands of, of Southern Arizona for over 20 years. In 2009, she somehow came upon a digital camera or maybe she had it and she just trained it on plants at that point. But starting in about 2009, she became uh, focused on botany and that's been one of her principal um, activities and uh, uh, engagements since then. She's had the privilege of working with Richard Felger and Jesus Sanchez on a flora of Nakapuli Canyon in Sonora. And she's also a co-author on a forthcoming flora of the Great Guayama San Carlos region in Sonora. In addition, she published a flora of the Solero Ranch property in 2020, which is available um, on Kenosha, if you want to try and dig that out. And she's currently involved in a couple of other projects, including a floor of the Santa Rita Mountains and a checklist of the Santa Cruz plant, Santa Cruz County plants. She says her specialty is bushy grassland hikes over uneven ground because that's where you find the best stuff. She says if she can't find plants, which is an unlikely situation, but if she can't find plants, she also looks at birds, photographs insects, and watches for interesting clouds. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Sue, and you can tell us about annual plants and how great they are. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for that introduction and uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks for making time in your evening for this talk and some others. Um, I'm going to talk to you about annuals, as Lynn mentioned. I think she actually gave most of my presentation for me, but I'll try to fill in a few bits around the edges. Um, why do annuals deserve our appreciation, our admiration, and our inclusion on our plant list? Don't just focus on the perennials. Those are important, but so are the annuals. So I'm dedicating this short talk to uh, my friend and colleague, Richard Felger, who passed away a year and nine days ago on Halloween last year. One of the many things I admired about Richard was that he really believed that any plant you would encounter out in the natural area deserved your full attention. Put it on your plant list, try to figure out its parts, describe its parts, make a key for it, take a photo, take a specimen. Thank you, Richard. So the desert Southwest, where most of us who are listening live, um, has a kind of monopoly on annuals. Um, the Sonoran Desert as a whole, which is not the whole desert Southwest, but the Sonoran Desert is about 50% annuals. You make a checklist, 50% annuals. That's a really high percentage of annuals. I grew up in the Northeast US and there's nowhere near that number of annuals on, on your flora list. In the driest parts of the Sonoran Desert, Mark Dimmitt estimated maybe 80 to 90% annuals for the plants that make up those habitats. As you get to slightly uh, more mesic, more wet areas, such as coastal Sonoran Desert, the Wymus region, which I'm familiar with, 34% annuals, so a little over a third. Um, the flora I did in the grasslands of Santa Cruz County, which is definitely not desert, but some call it semi-desert grassland. 37% annuals, so um, more than a third, less than half. And then if you take into account an entire mountain range, which is one of our beautiful sky islands, Jim Barrier did a flora of the Catalina Mountains in Pima County, and he found that mountain range that runs from desert to high peaks had 25% annuals. So essentially the drier the habitat, the higher the percentage of annuals in the checklist. And that means they are really important and we need to pay attention to them and not just write them off as this little fluff that disappears. But how do annuals persist in what can be a very harsh environment, a place where it doesn't rain reliably and it gets very hot? They persist as seeds. 
Um, Venable and Paik wrote, desert annuals spend most of their lives as seeds. Maybe not real sexy, but there they are. They're in the landscape, they're in the seed bank, and the seed bank is one of the most important features of uh, annuals and, and how they persist in the environment. Um, Mark Dimmitt wrote, annuals escape unfavorable conditions by not existing during such periods. It's another way of saying they just spend the rest of their, most of their lives as seeds. And these seeds are fascinating. You're gonna learn more about seeds tomorrow night in Sue Rutman's talk. I encourage you strongly to attend that one. Hopefully she'll feature a few annual seeds along with perennials. Seeds are fantastic. They're fascinating, they're quirky, they're cool looking. Um, the job of an annual is to produce as many seeds as possible to replace itself in the landscape for the next available good season when it might germinate and grow again, and also to provide extra for um, critters, um, birds, insects, people. We eat a lot of annual seeds and a lot of annual plants. So that's the job of an annual. It needs to produce seed and replace itself and then some in the landscape. So if there's a drought, such as the long-term drought we've been in and the sort of mega drought year that preceded this past year's monsoon, it's all about the seeds. Annuals have to be able to persist and they do that by being seeds. That's their key to longevity. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when it does rain, such as the mega monsoon event we had this past year, you don't really know what's gonna come up. It's not a one-to-one -one predictability. You can't just say all those annuals are gonna come up because we got 20 inches of rain or somebody told me 43 inches of rain on top of Mount Lemon. That was last night, Jim, um, Jim Malusa's talk. Not everything comes up every year. We don't really know why, but that's the fun of annuals as well, the surprise factor. You walk the same patch year after year, season after season, and different things come up. Things disappear, 10 years later they come back, or one year later they come back. So that's one of the things I love about annuals, the, the surprise factor. If you're into predictability, maybe perennials are your game. But I say pay attention to the annuals. They're really important and they're fun. So one of the things annuals are really good at is changing their size uh, to accord with conditions. Um, this cockleburr, everyone's favorite bristly um, burr-filled weed, uh, native plant though, let's celebrate it, can be very small in a poor rain year like the plant on the left, but it does its thing. It's got five, six leaves and it's got a whole host of burrs and that's enough to start a number of new plants. On the other hand, this summer we had a banner monsoon and the cockleburr on one of the places that I like to walk grew to eight foot tall and that's my husband holding up a couple of plants that were so top heavy they just fell over. So annuals can do pretty much what they need to. If there's a little rain, they make sure they reproduce. If there's a lot of rain, they reproduce like gangbusters. So morning glories are particularly good at size plasticity and growth and reproduction. If there's not a lot of rain, they put out their leaves, they put out some flowers right away and they get busy making fruit and making seeds because their job, as I said before, is to get seeds back into the seed bank. So these two plants look like they're well on their way to getting seed quickly back into the seed bank. With a little more rain, a nice monsoon, you can get a beautiful patch of bird's foot morning glory like this lavender spread of plants in the grassland. Um, it can be quite dramatic, cover a bit of a hillside with other plants in between. This is one of my favorite morning glories. Uh, doesn't, I don't see it every year, but uh, this year was a pretty good year for it. With a banner monsoon year, you can get a morning glory coverage that just coats the hillside in blue or red or purple or white or whatever species you're looking at. And this canyon morning glory was growing on the hill above my house. And it was an incredible coverage of about 90% coverage, very hard to walk in, but you sort of didn't mind. It's not prickly, it doesn't stick to you. It just requires a little careful stepping. Another plant that had a banner year was the spectacular Palmer amaranth. And oh my gosh, this summer, who knew there was so much 
Palmer amaranth in the landscape? Well, I guess now we know. Everywhere I went, there were patches that I couldn't avoid hiking through. And that's one of the good things about hiking poles. You just sort of whack away, push the plants out of your way. Even so, they're falling in your pockets, falling in your shoes, falling in your backpack, sticking in your hair. Um, a native plant, we have to give it credit. It's doing what it does best. And it is it does provide seed for birds and people do eat this plant when it's green, not when it's prickly like this, but it's pretty impressive. So even when annuals are aggravating, we need to appreciate how good they are at doing their job, getting that seed back in the seed bank. And oh boy, do we have enough Palmer amaranth for the next century, I would say. Okay, I have to admit I cheated. That slide with the cute little morning glories uh, a few minutes ago, I took those photos on October 3rd this fall. So those are not plants from a dry summer. Those are second generation morning glories that sprouted up from seeds that were formed during this monsoon. So the plants came up in July and August, they matured, they dropped their seed, and these plants are doing a second flowering. And that scarlet spiderling on the right even has a fruit capsule. So talk about opportunism. Annuals are extreme opportunists. Here we go, we're gonna have a second generation. Birds do this as well in a good year. They will have more than one brood, more than one set of nestlings come out of the nest. So annuals are no different. They take advantage, whatever they can get, make some seeds, put them back in the seed bank. Opportunism with spring annuals. Well, the purple mat on the lower left corner, the name of Hispida, that was a plant that one year just kept growing. It started in spring. Kept growing, kept going, kept going, kept going. I came across it in July, nicely flowering. Of course, that was the end of its life because I put it in my plant press and went on my happy way. But it took advantage. It was just enough moisture and where it was growing to keep going, keep going, keep going and make as much seed as it could to provide for the next population. So Cecilia leaves in the center photo, I photographed those in October and that plant if plants think, that plant is thinking it's spring already and it's getting ready to put up some stems and maybe flower. I don't know if I'll get back to that plant to see if it does flower in December. Maybe it'll die, maybe it will just persist and then really flower in the spring like it's supposed to, I don't know. The Virginia pepperweed on the right, I saw numerous um, plants of this this summer. It's a spring annual like all of these, but they decided to come up and flower and fruit this summer as well. So opportunism is not limited to the summer annuals, it happens for spring annuals as well, but annuals really are good at making do with whatever comes their way. So one of the things we're, we're, uh, we always look forward to with a good monsoon or a good spring uh, season is a big display of wildflowers. And this summer was no exception. So the um, poorly named summer poppy, it's not a poppy, it's a caltrop, um, put on a great display this summer in the grasslands of Santa Cruz County. I don't know how it was near where you live, but um, it was pretty spectacular. A little tough to hike through. It's more bristly than I realized um, when it's everywhere and you can't avoid it. It's got some prickliness to it, but it sure is beautiful. And look at all those seeds it's going to be making for the seed bank. A spring annual that can put on a really great display near where I live is a non-native, but one that I'm very fond of, common flax. This linum species um, is pretty widespread in the US. And usually I just see a handful of plants, one plant, two plants, but there's a patch near Solero Ranch that is just multiple acres. And in a good spring, good April, it just is blue as far as the eye can see. And then it all goes to seed and it's a huge tangle of seed, uh, seed capsules. And I don't care, doesn't seem to be spreading, doesn't seem to be doing anything wrong. And flax of course is food. Not to be outdone, the Mexican gold poppy is very, a very common sight in a good spring wildflower year. This photo was loaned to me by Karen LeMay and maybe Karen's here this evening. Thank you, Karen. It's an absolutely gorgeous photo. Karen told me that she took this photo on April 1st of 2020, just as the first COVID lockdowns were happening. It was kind of a grim time, 
in the news. Um, and she took the opportunity to drive over to the east side of the Chiricahuas, where there was a fantastic display of these poppies flowering, and I'm so glad she did. The photo was taken looking towards the Chiricahuas, towards Portal in Cochise County. Thank you, Karen. So annuals, they don't exactly move, but they can show up different places every year. You can have a big display here this year and then not the next year. They show up in a new place. You've never seen them there before. Perennials, on the other hand, they pick their spot and they better do well. They better like it because they're not moving. This is not an annual. It's a Palo Verde tree that of all places is growing under a cattle guard on an on-ramp to Interstate 19 in Santa Cruz County. I think it's a Mexican Palo Verde, but I haven't really stopped to look that closely. There's a lot of traffic. So I snapped these photos and went on my way. But this perennial, this is it. I mean, it's made its choice. It may or may not ever flower and fruit. Uh, it's just gonna sit here and live out its life under the cattle guard. So annuals show up kind of anywhere. They blow in, they waft in, they get tracked in, they stick to your pants and get deposited somewhere else. Perennials do get dispersed, but when they put down their roots, they stay there and that's where they're growing. So location, 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 that's what they say in real estate anyway. So one plant that had a really good year this summer was um, sensitive pea, Camacrista nictitans. It's an annual. Um, most of the time it grows about a foot and a half tall. This year it was more like three feet tall. Um, kind of a subtle flower, little yellow flower that's typically hidden by a leaf. You can see in the close-up, I think I'm holding up the leaf that's usually bent over the flower. Um, I've never seen fields of this plant like I did this summer. It's really, really a lovely little plant, kind of subtle, as I said, just makes a big green patch. But one of the knock-on effects of a big bloom like this of a certain annual is if it's a host plant for an insect, you're gonna get a lot of those insects. And sure enough, this is at least one host plant for the tailed orange butterfly. And there were, where I spent a lot of the summer, thousands of these tailed orange butterflies. Almost every canyon I walked down had 100, 100 at a time at a little seep, the adult butterflies. And when I found out later that this is one of their host plants, I went, ah, no wonder. These plants are everywhere, which means the caterpillars are everywhere, which means they're creating hundreds of, and thousands of the butterflies. So what a nice connection. What a reminder of how important annuals are. So we'll look at a, a couple more um, host plant uh, relationships. The gorgeous caterpillar on the left is Thoroa zephyrus. It's a moth. Um, and one of its host plants here is an annual euphorbia, a Mexican fire plant. So um, that is a real reason to celebrate these spurges, these euphorbias that pop up in certain years. I've heard that this, this plant in particular had a great year, uh, maybe in central Arizona. So that's great for this moth, hopefully. Hopefully there was a good reproduction of this Thoroa zethus, because what a great caterpillar to come across. On the right, the Turlu Sphinx moth caterpillar. It's a pretty big caterpillar, as most of the Sphinx moth caterpillars are. And it is being hosted by Borjavia erecta, or erect spiderling, an annual that had a great summer near where I was. Now, these caterpillars are big, as I mentioned. And when it crawls to the top of the plant, the plant's going to bend in half. Caterpillar just keeps eating, keeps eating until it uses up the parts it needs and crawls to another plant. But what an important reminder of how important these annuals are in the food web. These are harvester ants, Pogonomyrmix species, um, and they are busy, busy, busy collecting six weeks needle grama, um, an annual grass that gets in your socks. Well, the ants are using a part of it. They're harvesting it. They're taking it down into their colony. And I don't believe they use it for food. I think they use it um, as a substrate, maybe to grow something on. Um, but what an essential part of their life cycle. Annuals are a huge part of our food web. Um, here are four plants that um, we eat 
cultivated sunflowers, arugula, black mustard, and wheat. These just happen to be ones I've found growing as waifs out uh, in roadsides uh, next to the shore, um, next to a field. Um, but there are many, many more annuals I could mention. We eat a ton of these, and so do birds and other animals in the landscape. Annuals are an incredible source of food for all of us. So how do these annuals move themselves around so effectively? Unlike that perennial that was stuck under the cattle, uh, the cattle guard. Well, um, they have a lot of dispersal methods, a lot of just a lot of good strategies. This is one I just call poking. Um, all of these plants I show on the screen here are really good at poking. You've got the sand burr in the top one. That's a pretty painful one. You've got cockle burr on the top right. Not so painful, but they do they do hang onto your shoelaces pretty hard. Down in the lower left. You've got six weeks needle grandma and it's named needle grandma for a reason. It needles its way right into your socks. Just one of them will feel like you're being stabbed. In the lower middle, you've got Spanish needle, another needle. It's got two barbs that will even stick in your skin. And then in the lower right, you've got Palmer amaranth with a bonus um, Spanish needle stuck on it. So a double whammy. Aren't these annuals amazing at their strategy for moving around? So this is, uh, this is an opportunistic photo I took of a friend's socks and shoes. We went for a hike in November in the grassland and a good year for Spanish needle. And unfortunately for him, um, it was a good year for Spanish needle. And these Spanish needles just took complete advantage of his athletic socks and shoes. Um, unfortunately for the Spanish needle, they didn't accomplish their goal so much of repopulating a new area because when he left, he went right to Walmart, bought new shoes and socks and threw these away. So they ended up in the bin. But what an amazing strategy for moving around. This dispersal method is called Velcro. And it's what Mendelia uh, does. It sticks to you. It doesn't really poke and hurt. It just sticks to you like Velcro. Very effective. You can see on my pants on the right. And you can see on this cow on the left who very uh, cooperatively stopped by my car the other day. And I took a picture of her out the window. Very effective. Gets those annuals spread everywhere. And this year, Mendelia was going crazy in the grassland. So dispersal methods, there are many. And they're not limited to annuals. Perennials have these two, but here's just a few more. On the left, we'll call it stickiness. Euphorbia seeds get sticky when they get wet and they will stick to you or a bird or a critter. Fluffiness, that uh, nest straw or stylocline um, species in the middle. Many plants have this adaptation where the seeds are encased in some fluff or hairs and they just blow around in the landscape. And in the right, um, one of my favorite pond plants, which is Glinus radiatus or sweet juice. It just makes thousands of seeds. These seeds can withstand flooding, submerging. They can be under a cattle pond all summer and next year they'll do just fine, come right up again and make a giant patch of plants. So now I'm just going to have a quick glance at a number of annuals that I particularly like. Um, I can't cover them all, but um, Lilac bell or Ipomaea muricata is a relatively recent arrival in Arizona. It showed up on the Solero Ranch about three years ago, uh, a couple of plants. This year, um, the plants were numerous. There were dozens of plants. And as you can see the photo on the left, the plants were climbing to the top of a hackberry and a mesquite tree. Huge heart-shaped leaves, big lilac flowers that open around uh, 5.30 p.m. and don't stay open all the way till morning. By morning, they're sort of folded up. But um, I think this is a native occurrence. It occurs in Sonora, south of here. I mean, it's, um, morning glories are, tend to be weedy, but um, this is not the same as the sort of crop weeds that show up in the southeast U.S. Blue mud plantain. Um, when I first saw this plant years ago, I thought this has to be an escaped exotic. But no, it's native. It grows in slow moving fresh water. Um, not doesn't have to be perennial water, but it could be a cattle pond. It's an annual, of course. This particular patch was in a rock pool up on the side of a hill, steep hill, way up on the hill. 
So again, annuals, it just needed the water that fell during the summer rain, did its thing, flowered beautifully, made seed, and now it's ready for the next good year. So when you first see this photo on the left, you might say, oh, there's some plants just starting out. They're just forming some leaves. There's a little kind of weed patch happening. But if you get down on your knees and you get a lens or maybe a microscope, or maybe you have a 12 year old along who can really see things much better than the rest of us, you'll see that it's a complete plant. This spreading pygmy leaf or Lothlingia has complete tiny little petalless green flowers and it's already making fruit as well. So there's a complete package in a tiny bit or you can put about 10 of these in your hand. Another plant that's hard to spot but relatively widespread is this nemocladus, glandular thread plant. I have to admit, I've probably never spotted one while I've been standing up. I have to be sitting down, looking at something else, trying to collect a plant, kneeling down, trying to find something I've dropped on the ground and bam, there are these cool little flowers with white and red tipped petals. Again, fairly common, but you probably walk by hundreds of them without ever noticing. This is probably the most exciting find I had this summer, Jacamontia agrestis, midnight blue cluster vine, um, known for, for Arizona from the Baba Kivri Mountains. And then a friend, Jared, found it down in the Pajarito Mountains near the border. And then Jim Barrier and I were walking, hiking uh, in Chino Canyon in the Santa Rita Mountains near Elephant Head and found thousands upon thousands of these plants. It was astonishing. We were walking on them. You couldn't avoid it. What an exciting find. Both a new plant for both of us and new for the Santa Ritas. Um, anyway, that's what a good summer rain can do for you. I will close with one of my favorite grasses. It's a summer annual, Muhlenbergia sinuosa or marshland muley, which is a pretty inapt common name since it doesn't grow in marshes. We don't really have a lot of marshes around here. Um, but it does make a beautiful cloud. Uh, maybe it makes somebody think of a marsh. I don't know. I've heard these sprays of Muhlenbergia sinuosa described as pink clouds, also as fairy grass. That's a, that's a pretty nice name, fairy grass, although I suppose it wouldn't win in a vote. But anyway, one of my favorite grasses, there are a number of these annual Muhlenbergias that uh, look very similar and they're all cute. And that's it. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to take some questions. Great. Thank you so much, Sue. What, what gorgeous photos. And that's one of the comments in the chat. So people really appreciated the photos that you had. Here's a question from Frank Reckenbacher. So winter annuals produce and disperse seeds in the late spring, while summer annuals produce and disperse seeds in the fall. You pointed out some opportunistic germination of seeds out of season, but that's uncommon. Why don't all the winter seeds germinate in the monsoon and all the summer seeds germinate in the winter? Well, leave it to Frank to pose a question I definitely cannot answer. That's a great question, Frank. And I think that um, if you're looking for a project, that would be a really good one. I know you're a busy guy. But um, that is beyond the scope of my botany knowledge. But it's a fascinating question. Why do some annuals just not come up even in a really good year? Why do they sometimes come up in a bad year? And they do great. Where's the programming? What's happening behind the scenes that we don't know? I don't know. It's a great question. And one comment that just came in is one suggestion, maybe it's partly due to competition. It, it could be, although, I mean, and, and only my patch is really Santa Cruz County in Southeast Arizona and then a little bit down in the Wymus region. I, you, you can see patches of plants come up and other places that are sort of empty of plants or there are big gaps in the plant. So it's not just a question of space. I don't know if it's something chemical. I also feel like just in my experience, some plants will do their thing in a big way one year with or without a, you know, a monster rainfall. And the next year they don't really come up. So is there some programming? Do they take a couple of years before they come up? Um, two years, 10 years, I don't know. I see Michael Chamberlain has a comment up there. Maybe he can elucidate. And this is the last time question or comment that we have time for, but Michael says seeds will germinate selectively on the basis of temperature 
and as well as mo moisture. Um, and that another person says, germination inhibitors, particular to summer versus winter plants, allow species to occupy the same space without competition. This point, and thank you again very much for your great presentation. Very interesting, and of course, always full of great field stories. Um, and one comment about the socks was, ow, ow. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs>